I hope you had a lovely session, our first session at Charbagh. I know we have been showing these videos, but I'll still, I think, I'm more effective than that video. So, <laughs> so I'll request all of you, please keep the aisle very, very free. We don't want anybody to stand, to sit in the aisle. It's for your safety only. And as they were showing on the video, we do have you know, fire safety on the grounds, so be assured you will be safe here. The emergency exits, there's one here where you see the toilet sign, and one, of course, from where you have entered into the charbag. But in an emergency, stay calm, be with us, and I assure you, and my team assure you, that we will take you out to the safe area. Now, before we start the next session, I must thank our sponsors. This is the 11th year of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, and every year we come out stronger and better, and it's only because of the support our sponsors so first of all, of course, I want to thank Z, the partner for JLF. So that's why it's Z JLF, uh, Z JLF, uh, Jaipur Literature Festival. And it's powered by AU, Small Finance Bank. Our venue partners are Bank of Baroda, Cox and Kings here at Charbag, Rajan Kilachan for Mughal Tent, Amity University, Jaipur, and Rajasthan Tourism. Then Tanishk, Dettol Banega, Swatch India, British Council, Dove, Nokia, Assam Tourism, Penguin, Airtel, Kindle Direct Publishing, iStart, Getty Foundation, Mahindra Wall City, Airtel, oh sorry, Airtel Telecom Partners, are. This is a little confusing here. I'll do the correction here. I'll tell them to do the correction. But the Singleton, Kingfisher, Grover, SBI, and then our media partners, Danik Bhaskar, danikbhaskar.com, Rajasthan Patrika, Red FM, The Telegraph, Matrubhumi, Facebook, and Twitter. So these were our sponsors. And with these sponsors' support, we have been able to do this festival so effectively. And it's also because of all of you for coming in strong numbers every year, for every session, in every venue. So thank you all of you for being here. We will be soon ready with the next sessions. So we are waiting for the authors. They are here on the grounds. They will be here and we will start the next session very soon. The next session, as you all know, is the art of stillness with Pico Iyer in conversation with Patrick French. So thank you for being here and wait patiently for the authors. Thank you. <laughs>
official. Yeah. <laughs> this person who's like, uh, yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. But then uh, it, it passed, that moment passed. And it was fine, and he's in jail doing three life sentences or something. So uh, there's, there's times, I mean, I, I suppose when it, it's a sort of a um, best-selling series of novels, it's a hit TV show, sometimes, of course, you, you presume you're adding a lot of drama in, but it sounds like it's a fairly, I mean, it can be fairly dramatic, like a regular day on the job sometimes. It's not often that <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> okay. Um, you take a lot of liberties for television. You can't just have Temperance Brennan in her lab identifying bones. Yeah. So there is a little, we try to keep it authentic. I work as a producer on the show. We're done. We went for 12 seasons. Um, bones was the longest running scripted drama in the history of Fox. Wow. So we're pretty proud of that, but we are done. There came a time to wrap it up. But if she just was in her lab all day, every day looking at bones, it would make for a very boring yeah. Uh, TV <laughs> viewing, so we did have Brennan on television. On television. Yeah. But, the, I mean, the way they sort of, I think they do a good job of playing off the characters. I mean, you worked on the uh, show, of course, you were a producer as well. Um, it's, it's very interesting, because I think partly it's also the personality types playing off each other with the uh, main characters and also seeing it through her point of view. Yeah, so. and of course we had an ensemble cast. We had our core of five people with Temperance Brennan and Celie Booth and um, Hodgins and... Um, so, and each one of them is very different. And I think the, the strongest comedic element was um, Hodgins, Jack Hodgins, who was always constructing these experiments and setting up. In all my years working in the lab, we've never set up an experiment where we <laughs> shot turkeys or blew up, you know, whatever no. it is that Hodgins would do. <laughs> That's part of the magic formula. Yeah. Um, so, if we had to ask you, we had a question from George, actually, and this kind of ties in with one of my um, questions for you. Um, from Sydney asking, how many cases do you get in real life, like those in your books, which are extravagant, intricate murder mysteries where you really need to crack the case? How many, okay, I'll just take the beginning. How many do I get? It's extremely variable. Um, I think when I was busiest, and I've had to back off a bit because I am writing, I've been writing an adult book, I've been writing a young adult book, and I've been writing a screenplay for the show every year, which yeah. is a really demanding pace, so I don't do nearly as many cases now. I think my busiest years, I might have been doing 75 cases a year, wow. something like that. And how many of them kind of mirror this kind of very, uh, so I think the, the main question was where there sort of are these like intricate murder mysteries, you know, where you're kind of solving a case, kind of like. Well, I think another one of the, the fallacies, we, we did try to keep it authentic as far as the, the science goes. We yeah. never used any terminology or any technology that doesn't really exist. But one of the fantasies of television is that every single case gets solved. Yeah. And that's not necessarily true in real life. I Say have it a, ain't so. That's really disappointing. Yeah, yeah, no, they don't all get solved. I have a, a, I don't know if you remember, Tempe on TV has this wonderful storage facility. It's floor to ceiling and there's gl uh, glass and you can see the bones kind of glowing through. I have a closet and it has wooden shelves and I have cardboard boxes, and each of my cases in that closet has a handwritten card, just a good old three by five index card with the case number on it. Well, those cases in that, so it's much less glamorous than the lab at the Jeffersonian Institution, but each of those cases is there because either it hasn't been solved, it's somebody that's never been identified, or maybe they've been identified, but the trial is not complete, and we tend to, because nobody's been accused mm. or tried. Or sometimes there are just cases that the family doesn't want to claim. Wow. So it, they don't always have the happy endings yeah. that everything has in, in the television show. And is that, often the, I mean, is that often the case, or is that some of the cases? Would you, you know, say? somebody, journalists often ask me what percentage gets yeah, solved. I, I don't know. I just can't <laughs> answer that. Most. Yeah. Uh, most are identified. Yeah. Most are resolved, but not all. Okay. I mean, so there's obviously, like, I mean, uh, the fiction part of the, um, there, there's a lot um, in terms of how you uh, go about writing this, but what do you find the biggest differences, really, between, say, suppose the TV version that you said, apart from um, Tempe's character, but maybe the TV version um, that you've worked on, as well as your novels um, and your real life? Not just you versus a character, but what do you think the biggest differences are? I think, well, Tempe in the books doesn't drink, and that's definitely not true for me in real life. Um, 
the, the technology, the high tech, everything at the Jeffersonian Institution on television is absolutely high tech. And it's all real. We get it from medical supply houses. But that wonderful forensic platform that, that uh, they operate on and all the specialty areas and all the experimentation that Hodgins does, it's not nearly. Journalists who come to my lab in Montreal are always disappointed at oh. how, how <laughs> relatively low tech. Now, I do. We, the lab in Montreal, where t Book Tempe works, is a full spectrum crime and medical legal lab. So we have the pathologist, the anthropologist, the forensic dentist, but we also have uh, fire and arson and biology and uh, ballistics and all of those different. So if I need help from a colleague, I can go to a different department. But as far as me using scanning electron microscopy or gas chromatography, no, not so much. OK. <laughs> but so I, that's actually interesting because um, w it's been a while now, of course. But um, how did your colleagues first react to you know when this became such a um, huge phenomenon culturally and like you're saying across the world of course. Yeah, what that's uh, that's also a two-part question because there were my colleagues at the university because when I wrote the first two books I was still teaching full-time mm -hmm. at university and then there were my colleagues in the forensic lab. So my colleagues, <laughs> I'll never forget, you have your annual at the university review and you're reviewed on your professional activity, your academic teaching and then on your public service. So I remember at my annual review them looking at me and saying, you know, this book will not count as academic publishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that publisher perish thing. This is not yeah, one of those. <laughs> this is not going to count. Um, so there was a little, when you write a novel and you're in an English department, you're a hero. But when you write fiction and you're in a science department, eh, you're a little suspect. <laughs> Now, at the lab, it was quite different. And um, the first book is set in Montreal, where I work at the Laboratoire de Sciences Judiciaires de Benson Ligas. So I had a little bit, and it's all in French. Um, back in those days, I was the only English speaker that worked um, there. So I had a little bit of a lag time, because it wasn't published in French for a year after it came out in English. So I was a and I used a lot of my colleagues fairly blatantly. I change all the names and everything, but some were pretty recognizable. So I was a little bit nervous about what the reaction would be. But actually, the only people that were offended were the people that weren't in the book. Oh. It's like, you know, <laughs> wait, why didn't you use me? What's wrong with me? And they would drop by periodically and say, so, do you have any questions about <laughs> DNA or hair analysis? Or, so they were very happy with it. That's, yeah, I think somebody said this, that the closest thing to immortality is when you have a writer, like be careful how you, um, how you treat that. So now you're focusing on the books. Uh, there is a new non-Temperance Brennan book out. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Two Nights? Yeah, the book that came out last summer in the US uh, and Britain, Great Britain in English, um, is called Two Nights. And it's a brand new character. Uh, it's called an off-series book. And the main character's name is Sunday Night. And she has, she's very different from Temperance Brennan. Temperance Brennan is very cerebral and her skills are scientific skills. Sunday night has a lot of psychological baggage. She and her twin brother grew up in a cult. They were the only two to escape from that cult before the cult committed su mass suicide. We had a lot of those back in the 90s. With Jim Jones even before that. And then we had the Solar Temple in France and Switzerland. So I was present. The first deaths in the order of the Solar Temple were in Quebec, and we did the autopsies for that at our lab. So I wrote a book about cults. That was my second book called Death Du Jour. When I thought about 20 years later almost writing a new character, I thought, well, what if a child grew up in that situation? They grew up in one of these um, doomsday cults. Everybody they ever knew died. So that's what happened to Sunday night and her brother. So she's got a lot of issues. She's mm. got a lot of anger. She's got a lot of, um, a lot of angst, I guess you would say. <coughs> and um, she doesn't follow rules well at all. She got kicked out of high school. She joined the military. She got kicked out of the military. She was a cop briefly. She got injured. So she's got skills but different from Temperance Brennan. She's good with guns, she's good with surveillance, she's good with tracking. Um, so she's a really different character. 
And in the first book, she, gets, she lives alone. She lives, I have a, a home, a summer home on an island off Charleston, South Carolina. And off of that island, there's another island you can't get to, except oh. there's no ferry, there's no bridge, you have to have your own boat. So Sunday is living out there, because she's had it, she doesn't want to have anything to do with the world. Oh. And her foster father convinces her to help try to find this young girl who went missing in, in the bombing of a school and it is suspected she's been taken up by a cult. So Sun Sunday reluctantly agrees, not because it's her job. She's not a cop, she's not a PI, she's not a forensic scientist, but because she's personally compelled yeah. by her own issues to try to find um, this missing oh, young woman. So. That's fascinating. Was it, um, uh, it, it obviously was very emotional when, um, I know I read one of your interviews, when the bones, um, the Stevie's wrapped finally, I mean, yeah. the whole cast and for you. Oh, yeah. um, how does it feel, I mean, wait, are you going to be writing more um, with Temperance Brennan, or are you just giving it a break for a bit? I have just finished writing, um, two-part two answer, I have just finished writing a new Temperance Brennan book, so that'll be out next summer. Interestingly, it's called A Conspiracy of Bones. Ah. Which is the title. Explains the title of our session. Thank Which you. Which is the title of this session. And also I've Next just summer. signed with Warner Brothers um, for a TV project with the S Sunday Night character. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so that's going to be a series as well. Well, hopefully. We, uh, it was, um, the project uh, producer is a woman named Diablo Cody. And she had a film about 10 years ago called Juno. For which, oh, yeah, yeah for which she, she won the Oscar for the best original screenplay. So she's the project nice. um, producer for this. And we have a script. We pitched it and Fox bought it wow. immediately. So now we'll find out probably this week if we'll actually do a pilot. And then if you do a pilot, you'll find out if you actually get picked up. So television is always if, 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 <laughs> if, but we're moving along. That's incredible. Yeah, okay, this is yeah. a new chapter in the. Yeah, um, that yeah, is very exciting. Yeah. And you do have. I mean, I think that just to come back to the point about the, you know, uh, strong, uh, intelligent, and smart women protagonists. I think it's really important to see these. Um, have you gotten any reactions from, say, readers uh, over the years um, to do with just how kick-ass these women are? Oh, I, absolutely. And we have seen um, an increase at least in, in universities in the United States, it, um, a spike in the number of women enrolled in forensic science programs. Oh. A spike in the number of forensic science programs that exist, and a real increase in the number of women that have gone into well, them. So hopefully, I don't know if it's the books or the show, or a if mix. I have anything to do with it whatsoever, <laughs> but um, yeah. that's nice. That's incredible. Sometimes I think it's, you know, your imagination does set the boundaries of what you think you can do. So seeing sort of, um, you know, uh, role models fictional or otherwise. But take us uh, through a little bit. You've written now with your son uh, in the viral yes. uh, series, which I'd like to talk to you about, but you've also written with your daughter. So how is it, how does that work? I mean, it's, it's obviously juggling multiple roles. Does it get stressful around it's, the dinner table? Yeah, is it? I'm, yeah exa I'm, cr called, I'm crazy. I write with both <laughs> my kids, and they're both lawyers. Wow. So yeah, both of them have uh, law degrees and didn't like being lawyers. So um, Brendan and I wrote six virals books together. And again, that's Tori Brennan, who's uh, Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece. It's interesting. Um, we we split it up such that he he's better at some things, and I'm better at I'm better at the science. He's better at knowing what a 14-year-old might say. Um, and then we would have our editorial meetings and discuss. Our, and then I would take the manuscript and do all the editing in red ink, and he would get it destroy his art, as he would call it. And then we would have our editorial meetings where we discussed our creative differences. So those could be quite <laughs> interesting. <laughs> now with my daughter, but it worked. I mean, we yeah. did six books yeah. uh, together and then he dumped me and signed a contract and now he's doing his own too. He's doing a young adult series called Nemesis, which came wow. out last March. And the second one is called Genesis, that comes out this March. And now he's just signed to do a middle grade um, oh, level with cool. another author named Ali Condi. Wow. So he's off on, he's yeah. gone. He's off on his own, <laughs> he's doing his thing. Um, I write screenplays with my daughter. We yeah. would co-write episodes for Bones. And, That's um, really incredible. Yeah. 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 And I remember, I mean, you did say in one of the interviews that you did get a lot of, um, I, I think, children who, you know, 
uh, either fans of the show or the show wasn't really appropriate for them to be seeing, which is why, uh, you know, you thought of Tory Brennan? Yeah, one of the reasons we decided to do the Tory Brennan series is he hated being a lawyer and he desperately wanted something <laughs> else to do, so he came up with the idea. But um, parents would ask me, at signings or at events like this, can my daughter or my son read your Temperance Brennan books? And I'd say, well, how old are they? And they'd say, seven. And I'd say, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. But um, kids are watching Bones, yeah. as young kids as young as eight, nine, ten yeah. years old. There's a monkey in the tree up there. <laughs> it's a rhesus macaque. It's a macaque ah. mulata. I can tell you the there species. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> There's the anthropologist in me coming up. Um, and I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, the children. Yeah, so, children yeah, watching. So the... we decided to create a, a, a something for kids, something yeah. appropriate, because they were interested in forensic science. So um, let's write something where kids are using forensic science at a middle school to high school level. So yeah. that's what the virals. And then we pitched it to a publisher, and they said, we love it. Now just throw in a vampire or throw in a zombie. <laughs> and we said, no, we're not doing that. But um, we did come up with an idea where the kids do have some special abilities. Oh, okay. that, we, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. sorry, I was looking at my phone to see some of the questions that are coming in. And I definitely want to get a show of hands. If you have questions, we'll open, um, and I won't just keep hogging. That's great. There's one question there. We have. Um, well, oh, okay, so there's a comment saying that you're the best crime writer. I'll wait for more questions on Twitter. Maybe <laughs> oh, we no, can give up. Oh, read that again. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Reich's the best crime writer from uh, um, your fans on Twitter. Um, can we get a mic to the, and, you know, we'll just keep making this as interactive and conversational as possible. The second row. Sir? Uh, third row, rather. I can't even count. Meanwhile, I should just ask Kathy, you know, if the magic is going to rub off uh, <laughs> clearly. Um, does, it, does it ever, I mean, does it ever stop? Do you ever stop and it just, it's just pretty incredible what you've uh, you know, achieved in terms of? Well, if I, back in my youth, mm -hmm. if I were to project where I would be where I am now, I would never have thought, you know, yeah. that I would have 19 bestsellers, well, 25 if you count the kids' books and a TV show yeah. that, that lasted as long as it did. Yeah. And you never, we used to make jokes um, when we'd sit in the production offices about, oh yeah, if we get picked up for season two or when we get picked up to season four, that's when they'll be buying us all the Buicks and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, and then we went 12 seasons, which was which is incredible. unheard of. Yeah. But you still have that sort of daily writing routine? I mean, has, it, has your routine changed a lot or do you, how do you? No, I write every day that I'm home and free and yeah. not traveling or in the lab, which I'm not so much anymore. I write every day. It's incredible. I don't know how else you'd pull off <laughs> this many. Well, um, it's going to get easier now because I'm not writing the young adult books. But you might be getting but picked up But I might be writing Sunday. screenplays again, so yeah. <laughs> Keep mixing it up. Yes. Hello. Yeah, my name is Swati and I'm a freelance writer. My question to you is uh, that you've written nonfiction and academic books on your subject as well. Um, and then you thought of sort of writing novels that, you know, it'll be more fun. Um, do you ever think of going back to writing nonfiction or uh, both, uh, you know, kind of straddling both worlds? Yeah, do I ever think about going back to writing nonfiction? Um, not in the sense of writing forensic anthropology again. I've written um, some textbooks and I've written journal articles. Um, I, I'm not as actively involved, I'm not at all actively involved in research anymore. So I don't think that would even be possible, although I'm still on faculty at the university, but I haven't been teaching in like 17 or 18 years. I've been on sabbatical and then leave. It's a great job. You don't have to go there. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> I strongly recommend it. <laughs> but um, I have been talking to a journalist about doing a true crime kind of book where we, um, we've been uh, communicating and I've been consulting on a situation with some um, looks like a serial murderer is operating legitimately. It's always a serial murder, but it never is. In this case, it turns out it, it probably is. So possibly in that sense, I might do nonfiction, but not scientific nonfiction. Good question. Thank you. Um, yes, there's a gentleman in the back. I've been a fan of crime fiction for about 40 years, and uh, things have changed a lot 
like uh, in the past there wasn't this kind of detailed scientific uh, stuff like now you have your writing which is which are best sellers and there's linkedin rhyme which are best sellers and people now read books which are very very technical have a lot of scientific detail so why do you think that's happened that people uh, would read stuff that they wouldn't understand maybe but they would like to read it huh? all the same huh? Do you think that uh, he's saying that he's seen that crime fiction seems to have gotten more technical and scientific? Um, do you think that's? I think even even authors who didn't used to mention the coroner or the pathologist or the autopsy now feel obligated that they have to put that part in, and I think most um, books have at least some uh, nod to forensics now. It's it it can be annoying if. <laughs> Because they often get it wrong, <laughs> they often get the the facts wrong, which um, they shouldn't. Because they could call up a friendly forensic scientist who would be happy to help them out. I don't think um, it's. I can't speak for others, but there's nothing in my books that's too complicated. I try to bring it. That's one of the real challenges um, to being a scientist and then trying to write fiction for a general audience. Is and my publishers have told me this as well, is that academics tend to put way, way too much of their subject in there because they love it. I mean, they have a PhD in biomolecular biology or something, and they love it. Mm. But you have to keep it brief, and you have to keep it jargon-free. You can't use any of this special language we use to each other as scientists. Mm. You have to put it in understandable terms, and you have to make it entertaining. Yeah. You can't just do it as narrative. It has to be worked into the story somehow, either as dialogue or in some way. So I think those three things are, are critical um, in doing fiction for a general audience, putting the science in, um, but making it. And I think they're the same skills um, that you use in addressing a jury. You don't want to dumb it down, but you want to make, you want to keep their attention, and you want to make it understandable. Mm. So. I, actually, I do want to ask you though, because you know, there's obviously a lot to do with like pacing and um, suspense, especially when it's crime fiction. Um, did you know how did you hone that part of your craft? Uh, and did you have any um, favorites? Uh, were you a fan of any major crime fiction before you started writing? How did I hone my craft? Um, I just tried to write a book, the kind of book I like to read, and I have no training in um, fiction writing. In university, I avoided <laughs> literature classes. I tended to prefer to take zoology and physiology and be over in the science labs. So I took the obligatory introduction to fiction, introduction to poetry, and that was it. Mm. So I just, that's all I can say, is I tried to write the kind of book I would like to read. Mm. The kind of books I like to read tend to be dark. They tend to, I'm so distracted by that macaque. <laughs> Likewise, I feel. He's not moved. He's like, this is fascinating. Um, OK. Now I like in. to read. It's, I like the darker. Yeah. I like uh, Harlan Coben, and I like uh, Ian Rankin, and I like right. Jeff Deaver, and I like um, Tana French is very good. She's an Irish author. So I don't like the tea cozy kind of book, just the mystery. I really do prefer a thriller yeah. and a fairly dark thriller. That's, that's good insight. And thank you for the question. Um, there's one more there. In the back. But let me also add, I, I don't like books that just put violence in for, for gratuitous, for, it has to advance the story. Yeah. I don't like to have it there just for a sensationalist. Yeah. I don't hold back from describing what goes on at a crime scene or in an autopsy, but it has to have a purpose to the story. Because I think part of the reason my readers read my books is they're curious about that. Most people will never have to go to an autopsy. They'll never have to go to a crime scene. But they're curious about what happens yeah. in those situations. So I will put in details, but never just for grisly sensationalism. Never for the sake of just ha having just a... Just for the sake of yeah. making a bloody scene. Yeah. yeah, I don't care for that. That's good to know. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, pardon my accent. Um, your, your books cast a light on forensic anthropology in the lab. Has the, the book and the series had an impact on what happens in the lab? Has it actually reflected back, apart from the inclusion of more women in the, uh, in the, in the specialty? Have the book and the series, I'm sorry. Have they impacted what's happened oh, impacted in the workplace? Oh, impacted what's happening in your workplace. Oh, if, if, it, if it's had an impact Oh, is there a feedback loop? Um, we talk a lot about the CSI effect in the US um, on juries. 
has the fact that there's so much of this forensic science out there in popular literature and on television, has that impacted jurors and their expectations of, of a case? And uh, opinions are mixed. I think jurors are much more sophisticated about forensic science is a very powerful tool. Um, they're aware of that, but sometimes they're not aware of where is the proper application. For example, if you're sitting on a jury for an automobile you know, bumper crash, they might ask, well, is there DNA? Well, you're not going to do DNA in that kind of situation. So I think it's a good thing that the public is much more aware of it, and I think it also can um, create Personally, I think he meant personally. Work, um, in the lab itself. Uh, so, so in the lab itself. Yes. Does the work impact uh, the work in the lab? Gosh, I'm, I'm, that's hard for me to anthology for the Mystery Writers of America, wow. which is due February 15th. Oh, so <laughs> I will have two weeks, and I have to say, I'm just like, blank, what do I write about? But this is probably the first, it's a short story where I have to bring two characters together who wouldn't normally be together. So I think I'm going to bring Tempest and, and, and Sunday Night together. Oh. Beyond that, I have tent in which you know all of this transpired or we can give you some space at the festival to sit in right you know? okay. yeah maybe um, murder in, <laughs> in india or something um i, I wonder though do, do you find that people write to you uh, because uh, you know especially given the high profile nature of your work i mean do you find people writing to you about obscure cases or um, i have people giving me ideas for books ah a lot i'm sure every okay. author um yeah. experiences that and some of them are good and some of them are less good <laughs> <laughs> no pressure guys uh, okay we have a question in the back and then we can come to find uh, hi, I'm a college student. My name is Sakshi, and I just want to say that I was one of those kids who enjoyed your show. <laughs> so, uh, I have two questions for you, actually. The first question is, uh, as, a, as an anthropologist becoming a producer, what were the things that you were adamant about that the show had to have? Things you weren't willing to compromise on? What am I adamant about? Sorry. In the show. In the Sorry, show? Yeah. You wanted to make sure that the show did not compromise on it. Oh, um, my main role as a producer on that show was to work with the writers and make sure that the science was accurate. Now we would push the, push the edge with the Angelatron, for example, where Angela would do this with her tablet mm. and create facial reproductions. That's really, it can be done, but um, I've never worked in a lab that had anything that came close to having that kind of apparatus. So my role was whenever they would do something that really just didn't exist or just you, you, you can't do that. I remember my executive producer, who I didn't know at the time, um, when we were shooting the pilot 12 years ago, I was there and he said he was terrified that I was going to object to everything. And we got out, it was called an episode called The Lady in the Lake and they had discovered these remains that had been in the bottom of a lake for two years. And I looked at it, and it was a beautiful, our props people were amazing, all of the diff, it's hard. We did 200 and, I don't know, 80 episodes, and you have to come up with a messed up set of remains every single week, and they all have to be different. But I remember looking at it, and it was a skeleton, and it, okay, that, fair enough, but they had all these wonderful plastic, bloated intestines. 
And I looked at it and I went, no. Two years underwater, no, no. You lose the intestines. So he thought I was going to object to every single <laughs> little thing that they did. But there were very few. And by the time we got to season five or so, our writers, we had a staff of seven, I think, full-time writers. They were so sophisticated in forensic anthropology, I think they could have sat for their master's exams and passed them. So their questions to me were abundant in the early few seasons, but by about season five or six, they really got it. And we also had wonderful researchers, so. Oh, that's incredible. Okay, uh, you want to put a quick second question, then we'll go to the person in front of you. Uh, the other thing is also for the new show that you uh, might be doing uh, on Sunday night. Do uh, I have anything, any? No, uh, what the question I had was, what are the things, because uh, for me, when I was watching Bones, it was a lot about the fact that it was a woman in science, and she was touching Bones, and she wasn't creeped out by them, and she was learning a lot from them. So are there any kind of things like that that you'll be bringing to the new show, nice. like okay. issues? Well, the new, sh the new character is really different. Um, so she, um, gosh, I'm trying to think what I can say. I, from the new script, um, it's going to be, they're going to be continuing stories that go, assuming we get picked up and we actually go on air. But um, it's gonna have, it's gonna be similar. It's gonna be a character-based show, not a procedural so much. And it's gonna follow um, Sunday night and her twin brother whose name is August. Um, the idea for this cult came from my second book, Death Du Jour. And the cult in that book had no name and people didn't have to have any name. They could have any name they wanted. So Sunday was born on a Sunday, so they mm -hmm. called her Sunday. Her twin brother, it was August, they called him August. So her last name came from when they escape, they, they're completely unaware of how to live in the real world. They, they don't know how to use a phone, they don't know how to drive a car. They get busted almost immediately, and the cop who finds them says, what's your name? Well, it's Sunday. What's your full name, kid? It, it's Sunday. If you don't tell me here, you're going to tell me at the station. And she hears a Neil Diamond song playing in the background. It's a hot August night. And so she says, "Night. My name is Sunday Night." So that's how she got how she got her name. So the show will be similar in that there will be humor in it. It will be character based. It will be very different because the main character is very different from Princess Brennan. There was a person right in front and then a front row. There? Okay. I'd also um, just like to say that I'm a great fan of yours and a lot, I read a lot of crime fiction. You mentioned CSI and its impact on jurors. We don't have the jury system, but we also have um, a lot of um, um, suspicion that in our country, especially forensic science is really not as developed as, let's say, in the US. And we get this impression, obviously, from popular books and TV serials. I was curious to know whether in, let's say, in the American continent, both Canada and US probably, where there is much more developed, this whole business of investigation, have you found um, or have there been instances when real life investigators maybe get ideas from, let's say, a resolution of a particular the crime uh, yeah, situation, I think, yeah. and do they come to you and tell you that, look, you, because we were watching your show, or we read a book of yours, yeah. and it works in real life, you know, it translates yeah, from had, fiction. Okay. That I would be interesting had, to know. I have <laughs> had inquiries from detectives who have read my book and have questions for me because of a case that they're working on. So the a short answer is yes, that does happen. Oh, that's incredible. That must be um, quite familiar. Okay, there's a gentleman who's been waiting patiently in the front row. Yeah, hi. My name is Khurram, and I read a lot of fiction uh, books, and especially on the crime thing. And uh, see, just a basic question. Uh, so when did it occur to you that you wanted to become a writer? That's a very basic, because I'm also wanting to write something, because I've been trying very hard. When did I decide I wanted to become a writer? Um, well, you're always a writer. If you're an academic, we have a saying, you have to publish or perish. So you have to write. It's just a very different kind of writing. It's scientific writing. So I made the transition to writing fiction, as I said, when I, when I had the freedom um, to do something like that. I, I made the highest rank you can make at the university. 
so I could, you know, I could do something um, enjoyable, something new. I wanted to try something I hadn't done before. I had a colleague who was writing uh, romance novels. And I don't know if you know this, but in the U.S., university professors are not well paid. They're not overly well paid. So, and I had three kids, and they were moving towards university, and they were talking about going to private universities, which is pretty expensive in the U.S., so I thought, well, how could I make a little bit of extra money? And I had this colleague who was writing romance novels, Western romance novels involving cowboys. <laughs> and I read one, and I thought, yeah, I think <laughs> I think I can do this. <laughs> so I just, I thought I would, um, and I wrote a partial manuscript and a uh, different title, but with the character Temperance Brennan. And it was in third person voice. And I got about two thirds of the way through it, and I read it, and it was just boring. It was just, it just didn't work. I put it away for a while, and then um, I decided to get serious about it, and I switched to first person voice. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was like telling my own story through Temperance Brennan, and for me, that just worked. And I told myself, I will finish this, and I set a limit of 50 rejects if I pu send it out to 50 publishers and they all reject it, then I'll take that as a commentary on my writing skills and I'll go back to my day job. So that's... How, how many did... Did you get rejections before you got the publisher you wanted? I did not. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. The first publisher to who... And I knew nothing about commercial fiction publishing. I'd done academic. Yeah. So when I finished the book, my daughter helped me write a letter, a cover letter, and I just, and she had a friend who worked for some publishing house. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll send it to her, you know, why yeah. not? So we just mailed it in, and yeah. the, I, Scribner, I sent it to Scribner. Oh, nice. And they bought it within 10 days, just wow. like that. So Seriously, we need the magic to rub off on the rest I of <laughs> It's um, not the way to go about it. <laughs> Yeah, I think maybe we should give the, the other stories to the rest of every, you know, all the yeah, aspiring yeah. writers here. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, we have a question in the th uh, third, fourth row. But just before that, I want to ask you, though, I mean, for you to choose forensic anthropology also when you did, um, that must have been a quite, unusual, uh, quite an unusual decision. What was your... Yeah, it, it was. Um, as an undergraduate, I mer majored in, I think, five different things. And then I took a class in physical, biological anthropology. And you learn about the human skeleton, osteology, but also human evolution, primate behavior. I used to teach courses in primate behavior, which is why I'm That's fascinating <laughs> with, with this macaque. Um, so you take the whole spectrum of biological anthropology. Then when I went to grad school, um, I knew I wanted to focus on um, uh, human evolution. I wanted to look at, and prehistoric Native American populations the paleopathology and paleoepidemiology of two lower Illinois River Valley Hopewellian populations. Has anybody read that? <laughs> mm, no. That was my dissertation. <laughs> wow. I think my mother read it. Oh. <laughs> um, so uh, that's what I wanted to do. And I took a position at a university, and I was teaching bioarchaeology when police started bringing me cases. Uh. And once I started doing, and I remember my first case, it was a child homicide. And once I started doing that kind of work, I really was attracted to, I like the relevance of it. I love archaeology, but if you're wrong, well, even if you're right, you're going to get into long discussions with your colleagues in the literature. You're not going to impact anyone's life. Mm. But when you do a forensic ID or when you testify in court, you are going to impact somebody's yeah. life. And I like the idea of that. So I went back, I retrained, and, and moved into forensics. Oh, Hi, I'm Ajay Aspal. Uh, Katie, I'll request you not to get distracted by macaques or apes or monkeys. <laughs> Despite uh, what uh, one of our ministers might say, we still consider them as our ancestors. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. My question is that uh, like, uh, for a producer or writer, I believe, especially writing fiction, it uh, pays, often it pays to highlight the gory details and those sort of things which uh, uh, people would like to read. As a forensic uh, anthropologist, as especially as a physical forensic anthropologist, you would be required to be much more objective and maybe not uh, that uh, showy type. And secondly, uh, as a cultural social anthropologist, you would be required to give a lot of value to cultural relativism. So does that tie your hands at times while writing or while producing? 
not to highlight those gory details about some cultures which might make value in productions or in books. Does being a forensic anthropologist, or an anthropologist first restrict yeah. me in how I approach writing either a screenplay or a Especially book. in highlighting those bloody or gory details about some cultures in a particular crime which might fetch value in readership terms but which might uh, uh, denigrate that particular uh, culture. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure I fully understand. So just to unpack it a little bit, I mean, it, as a producer, if, I mean, if there were details, I, I think you're suggesting gory, gruesome details that would perhaps be denigrating a culture, but important to a story. I think. I mean, I, I feel that you're asking your forensic anthropology hat versus your your producer and writer hat. Uh, if that sort of they hamper each other, or you know, especially when it comes to cultures that are um, involved. Hmm. Sorry, I think I that. I think was, when you're writing fiction, the bottom line is you want to write a good story. Hmm. Your readers want a good story, and I think the way my books do, I write murder mysteries. But they're thrillers, um, so there's an element of, of tension and violence. The difference is the solution isn't, it's science driven. Mm. It's not just intuitive or gut instinct or good old fashioned police legwork. And that, that's kind of the main premise to Bones, yeah. is that the two main characters approach crime solving in very different ways. On the one hand, you have Seely Booth, who, and it's a gender reversal stereotype. Yeah. On the one hand, you have Seely Booth, who's emotional. He goes by gut instinct. He believes in good old-fashioned speculation and legwork. On the other hand, you have Temperance Brennan, and the, which is typically more of a female stereotype. On the other hand, you have Temperance Brennan and the squints, who are cerebral, who insist on science, hypothesis formulation, hypothesis testing. Mm. It's a different approach to crime solving, and the two of them coming up against each other yeah. lends itself to some of the comedy in the show, I yeah. think. So I, I'm not sure if I've answered your so question. I, so I suppose when you're writing it though, I mean, you're writing as a writer, but the science is always, the scientist in you is always there just to make sure the internal logic and the... Absolutely, and I think having trained in science, and I think for my two offspring, having trained in law, it teaches you logical thinking, mm. and it teaches you to stay focused on the main point the main issue to follow um, logically through to the conclusion, and I think that's um, important in a murder mystery. Yeah, in, in a, in a and I think you sort of answered the bit about the sensationalism earlier when she was saying that, you know, you wouldn't put details in just because it's sensational. Um, as but I wouldn't to, hold them back. Yeah, if it's important to the if story. If it's important to the story, if it yeah. advances the story, I will put in um, gruesome details. I just won't put them there for the sake of yeah. salacious gore. Yeah. Okay, so we have three minutes. Let's do, uh, okay, yes, very enthusiastic there. Can we get the mic to, can you want to stand up? Can we probably take one question or a second one if we get a quick one. Yes, okay. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm totally starstruck. I'm a big fan of yours and thank you so much for coming to India. Oh, thank uh, you for inviting me here. I'm loving it. Yeah. So uh, I'm a law student uh, from Delhi University, and my question to you is a little from the legal perspective. Um, in India, we've already disregarded a lot of scientific techniques for uh, you know crime solving and investigations. Now, your method, at least what is portrayed in the uh, you know in the books as well as in the soaps, uh, is very accurate and kind of you know gives us good results. Uh, what would you suggest to investigating teams in India or the investigating system in India so that they are more accepting towards these new systems and these new science, um, you know, upcoming techniques? Uh, techniques? Okay. Thank you. I, I think you're very open to developments in forensic science. Every year at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, there is an in, quite a large representation by Indian forensic scientists. So I think there is you're very receptive to new techniques and new methodologies. Um, at least in my experience of having met many of my colleagues who are from India here over in the US. Ouch. Oh, that's good insight. Um, okay, well, really quickly, if you can give us in, the, in 30 seconds, can you frame your question? Tick tock, tick tock. One last question, guys, 30 seconds. So, 
Uh, okay. Do you want to just say it out loud? Stand up and speak. We almost made it through without a glitch. <laughs> I know, I'm so close. Uh, you said there are a lot of courses in forensics coming up and a lot of people enrolling in it. Do you think this is acting as any kind of a deterrent to crime that people may think that they, have, they are more likely to get caught so society is becoming safer? Is there any oh, statistic to support right. that? So uh, do you think it's a you, deterrent to crime? Okay, yeah. yeah. Less people are likely crime. to commit crime because of increase in forensics. Okay. Use of forensics in solving so crime. Do you think it's potentially deterrent to, cr uh, to cr potential criminals because there's more interest in forensic science? Yeah, that's a, I'm, I'm often asked that question. I can't answer because I'm not on the criminal side of it. But um, I don't think it's, maybe it's deterring them because the, the, the TV, uh, the message that comes from books like mine and TV is everybody gets caught. Yeah. Is the bad guy or the bad girl always gets caught yeah. in the end. So hopefully there's that message as well. And I, you know, maybe we are educating some element of the criminal world, but yeah. there's a whole big element that I don't think reads. And I mean, I think, yeah, <laughs> and here as well, there's horrific cases, I think, that we've been tracking in the news. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Kathy Rice, for taking the time, and thank, thank you all you. for being here. Big thank round you. of applause. We did it in a good time. That's okay. fun. Trent. So one more time, a big round of applause for a lovely session by Kathy Wright and Amrita Tripathi. It was actually very, very interesting. And I think many people have been motivated to write their first book, like I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm.